from the rugged shore and woodlands of the north. It's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again at all that waits the sportsmen in the state of Michigan. And sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow And the stillness of the forest lies encased in arctic cold The wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can It tells you of the beauty in the state of Michigan Hi there, come on in. Tonight is Sportsman's Night on PBS. It's Big Buck Night, the one night of the year that three quarters of a million Michigan deer hunters wait to see. In this slot right now, this is the half hour time when we normally have the Michigan Outdoor Show. It's not the Big Buck Night, but this show is a perfect complement to Big Buck Night. Now you might know Catherine Mulhaupt as the editor of the Outdoor Digest. Well, right now you're looking at her shred, the last of the PBS Wildlife Art Prints Midnight Vigil by Dave Bowman. That edition is closed. No more Midnight Vigils are available. But Catherine is our creative director and art director, and she put in its place Daybreak a concept which she commissioned West Bloomfield artist Heiner Hertling to paint. An interesting story behind this white-tailed deer painting coming up, so you stay tuned. It's Thursday night, time for Big Buck Night on Michigan Outdoors. Artist Heiner Hertling of West Bloomfield has created something special with Daybreak, the 1989 PBS limited edition wildlife art print. Heiner's a versatile artist, and I knew he could capture the mood of an opening morning encounter in a way any hunter could relate to. I spend a lot of time outdoors, and in my paintings I'm trying often to cap capture a mood or a, a setting that I've seen somewhere. So when you asked me to do this project, that just gives me an excuse to zero in on it and, and go. Well, one thing that I notice about the painting and people have commented it's very different from the style that many people identify yeah. with you which was a very fine detailed yeah. watercolor style why the drastic change well i received my art training in germany and have been an artist all my life mostly commercial art so the problem of handling certain different media is not not a big problem to me mm -hmm. When I see a subject like a mandarin duck or a, a grouse, and I'm fascinated by the detail, by all the tiny little beautiful things in it, then I sit down and do a real tight watercolor or even oils where I want to emphasize the detail. On a scene like this, the detail would distract from it. Here we have a mood, a, a morning scene, frost, sun coming up, and it asks for a different painting style. And since I had a good education to put paint in the right place, it doesn't really present a challenge to use a watercolor or oil or pastels. Or The big problem still will be to put the right color in the right place. And it, it, it's slightly a problem for me with my galleries and my collectors often. They would like to see a typical hurtling style. And I confuse them by doing something very tight and then something very impressionistic. But I guess it would bore me, honestly, mm -hmm. to do the same thing over and over. Mm -hmm. I find myself painting a four-foot loose, so-called loose oil painting outdoors, and then come home and spend three days and nights on doing a very tight little bird. But I love the switch. I love the challenge. Of well, now, this was a project a little different, I would imagine, from a lot of commissions in that I had some pretty specific ideas about yeah. things I wanted to see in the painting. How did you go about trying to satisfy Well, <laughs> to be very honest, it, it helped me. Did it? I'm a com like I said before, I'm a commercial artist and I work for clients. Mm -hmm. And clients give you deadlines mm -hmm. and specific orders. Now, when you're the art director and you told me about this deer painting and what you had in mind, it was very comfortable for me. It made it actually easier because you fed me ideas. Mm -hmm. And then I could add my creative part to it and you know, come back to you and, and we discussed it. And after making the first sketches, often I make the sketch before I even have a, an idea where I will get the reference. Mm -hmm. But once the first sketch is done, I can go out and look for the right background and the right animals. And, and uh, you gave us two sketches mm -hmm. when you sent us the preliminary sketches. Yeah. 
In this sketch, you had a black and white. Well, once you get an idea and a setting, you should, con I constantly use a pencil on any kind of paper, just, they're called thumbnails, just mm -hmm. little sketches. They don't have to be correct. When I get to this stage, what I send to you, it's a value sketch with a pencil. I can indicate where I want the darks mm -hmm. and the lights mm -hmm. and the balance of the, the whole feeling. It will ex would explain to you what I have in mind and if that's agreeable with you. To make sure the picture works yeah. even without the color. And I'm not even worried about color at this stage. I'm more worried about values, darks and lights. Mm -hmm. In this, in this sketch, there was I left the dough out. We right. never thought about the dough. We, we just wanted to, to show the buck. Point. Yeah. And the dough was kind of an afterthought because it lacked depth and perspective, and it would help me. And it also added a nice little focal point of the two heads towards the center of the picture. Now you added the dough pretty much at the last minute. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was something that. Well. Pretty when much the sent, night before I came down to see the painting. You yeah. <laughs> when you sent the pencil sketch back to me and you made your little remarks all over it, which I appreciated, uh, I went to a color sketch, which is basically the same I sent you before, but with watercolor, I just indicated what color scheme you wanted to go into, either a real cool setting or morning light. Or, and it, again, something bothered me, and often I don't know what it is, mm -hmm. till I stumbled onto putting a dough into it. Mm -hmm. The dough added the perspective and maybe a little bit of a story or intimacy or mm -hmm. little intrigue. Mm -hmm. The buck mm -hmm. that's in this picture, you used him from a slide, but we also found we had some videotapes uh, that we sent to you. You don't really use something cold. Uh, very rarely does it happen. Mm -hmm. You might have one photograph or piece of reference after collecting reference for years where you really like the position of the feet. Mm -hmm. And another one, the ears are just right. So when you do your, your sketches and your drawing, you, you try to get the best out of all these references. And you sent me a ta even a videotape. Mm -hmm. Fred sent me a videotape where I could watch deer in motion mm -hmm. for 45 minutes. And on my first sketch, you made some pretty potent remarks about why the deer didn't look right. Mm -hmm. Even though it was a photograph I had, mm -hmm. you try to emphasize characteristics of, of an animal, of mm -hmm. any subject, sometimes even a tree. They all have character and they all have a certain personality. Mm -hmm. The looser style is part of it as a necessity because when you do paint outdoors, which is the ideal place to paint, your time is limited, your light changes. Mm -hmm. You know, the conditions aren't a right to stand there for mm -hmm. hours on end. Uh, too much detail, sure there's detail in grass, but this is a deer painting in a morning scene. Mm -hmm. If I would spend all kinds of time putting little branches and little leaves mm -hmm. into this painting, it would confuse the, the onlooker. It would, con it would make it uneasy to look at mm -hmm. because I'm not leading the lookers, the viewer's eye towards what I wanted to paint, which is the deer. What do you like best about this particular painting? I guess I'm very happy with the morning mood, the feeling of frosted grass and the cool mornings. And I just about feel getting wet boots going through this stuff because I've done it so often. I also hope that people who look at this the first time come back to look at it again. And to me, a, a, a nice painting will get better the more you look at it. Something that sometimes strikes you first, right away, and then you get tired of it after three months, is not what I like to do. I like to, something to grow on people and get better with time. I don't know if I achieved that, but that's my goal anyhow. I see by way of a newspaper report from Associated Press that the Boy Scouts are considering a ban on killing animals to eat in wilderness training. Now it seems as though a group of scouts were shown how to kill and eat rabbits as part of a survival course. Some group called Transspecies Unlimited, according to the report, called it an inappropriate lesson for youngsters not in keeping with the goals of good citizenship. And get this, they want charges filed for cruelty to animals and they want the adult leaders dismissed from scouting permanently. 
Now it's too bad the Boy Scouts are the ones that have to take the heat in this battle. When they teach how to kill to survive in the wilderness, well this training is a technique as old as civilization and far more traditional than scouting itself. It has saved lives in the past and will again in the future. Now hunters should let the Boy Scouts know that we support them and ask them not to cave into this group's request because if they do, it'll only be a matter of time before another fringe group will be back demanding that this time the Boy Scouts teach an anti-gun and anti-hunting gospel. Scott Redder from Holland asks about the numbers game. Every year he says the DNR and your show say that so many deer were killed by bow or rifle, a grand total of 250,000 plus. How are these kill numbers determined? How does the DNR know about the deer that are taken home and shown only to family and friends? Through mail surveys, Larry. Last year, some 58,000 hunters were sent surveys. 90% responded. The computer projection? Some 320,000 deer taken in 1987. To check the accuracy, one year every deer had to be registered in Lake County, and the postseason mail survey on the Lake County sample was only off 1%. So the DNR surveys are accurate. Sport fishermen spent $28 billion to go fishing in 1985. What percent of the population participated in fishing and spent this money? Well, according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services survey, 58 million people ages six years and up went fishing in 1985, and that represented 27% of the United States population. The number one appetizer in 1988 was North Country Spread. That's in our Fish and Wild Game cooking contest in March. Eva Pecan from Posen. Oh, this is a winner. Oh, absolutely. You can see why it's a winner. You got, this could be, this is leftover venison roast. It could oh, be my. any kind of leftover game, um, or beef even. And you want to grind it after it's been roasted or cooked in the oven or grilled even. And then you're going to add onions, dill pickle, celery, and a sweet pepper relish um, gives it color and mm. a little bit of sweetness to it. And you're going to mix everything all up in a, into your roast. Now, I, I hope people don't get the idea that this is just a way to use up leftovers. Oh, Because no. I have tasted this, and I think I am more enthusiastic. I could eat more of this than oh, you <laughs> almost eat any this. recipe that we've had. It'd be worth boiling or cooking or roasting the meat just for this. And then you can make a sauce out of mayonnaise and mustard and then just pour everything all together. And that kind of keeps it stuck together and just gives it a real mm -hmm. good flavor here. Well, this is a, a spread that would be on sandwiches. And of course, Eva recommends this as an as a appetizer or a dip, but Bob Garner had to make a sandwich out of it. Hey, I tell you what, this is a slow process to take these things individually. <laughs> put, put a bunch, bunch of the dip on them and uh, then go to work. So if you make a triple decker like this, about two bites and you got it all. With a Triscuit in the middle. Mm-hmm. Boy, I tell you. Hey, try it. Don't knock it until you try it. This oh, is good stuff. I just heap a lot of the spread on it. Oh, this is, good. you know, I, I got to admit, I can't taste the elk or the venison or whatever. Oh, no, it's venison. It is venison. I mean, it's... I'm overwhelmed by the... Mm -hmm. Onions and a celery ah. and a sweet pickle relish oh. really adds to it. There's just a little bit of sweetness there. It's mm -hmm. almost like the, the bologna type mm -hmm. sandwich or ham sandwich. No. no, 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 yes it is. No, it isn't. It it's is almost like that it in the fact like that it it's seasoning. In the fact that it's seasoning, but at the same time, with oh. this, with the venison in it, it's oh. really great. It's not all fatty. Oh, yeah. Really yeah. good. Oh, no comparison with the bologna. <laughs> This is stupendous. Oh, How come great. you didn't tell us it was this good in the recipe contest? Why should I let you in on a good thing? <laughs> Before you get outdoors this weekend, I want to ask you to do one thing. Go to your phone and make a pledge to your local PBS station. Help out our underwriters keep Michigan Outdoors strong. <laughs>